God has an encouraging word for you today through the Bible-based teaching of Dr. Don Wilton. Well-known author, evangelist, and pastor, today's message is Despite Unbelievers, and we'll head to Mark chapter 15 in just a moment. As we study God's Word together, connect with us online at TEWonline.org or on the phone at 866-899-9673. Now, let's open our hearts and God's Word together with Dr. Don Wilson and God's encouraging Word. Our God and our Father, you see us today. You see way beyond. You see our innermost hearts You know us, and that's why you went to the cross, because you love us so much. Lord Jesus, speak to our hearts today. Show us who you are, our Savior and Lord. We pray for one another. We intercede, O God, We come before the throne of grace because of your death and glorious resurrection. We have your permission. You have enabled us to come to God the Father directly in the name of Jesus. We don't have to go through a preacher or a priest We don't have to go through a pope or a king or a minister or a pastor. We can come to you, God, because of Jesus. And we come to you today. We come seeking your face, crying out to you for the people of this world, this strange dichotomy, this wonderful world, this beautiful world, this world, Lord, that just has so much, and yet there are so many who are so far from God. Oh, God, we come to you today as we open your word and as we participate. We see you carrying us through You're the one who never leaves us. Everything you did was designed that you, Jesus, would carry us through because you are our Savior. So, Lord Jesus, we have met to worship you. We come with hearts open, thankful, desperately calling out to you in our repentance confessing before you, crying out to you, thanking you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just want you to know if you're listening today, I speak on behalf of so many of us. We see you. I see you. Thank you for the letters, the notes, the emails that you write. Many of them have got my name on them. You write to me, but I hear you and I I see you. I see you there in Syria and Iraq. Those people that contact us from places, far away places. We see you now in Ukraine. You're a precious believer. I see you. And you're looking at destruction and bodies lying in the streets and cruelty. You're wondering why. And we gather together and we we're meeting together around the Lord Jesus today. It's in his name. You know, this past week, I'm so proud of our, of our students here in Spartanburg who fanned out to venues and sites from New Orleans to Kentucky and even in our own city of Spartanburg. Scores of our young people. Just magnificent. The way you went about what God gave to you to do. 
and we've already seen lives changed. This morning in Genesis, just a few moments ago, people following the Lord Jesus in believers' baptism, then again in the second Genesis service today. Some of those being baptized today are the completeness of what God does. Some who were baptized received invitations from you to come to trunk or treat back in the fall of last year. And they got an invitation to come. Somebody said, why don't you come? And they came. And through that, these young people met Jesus. And they were drawn into the heart of God's people. And when they met Jesus, they became part of a family like this. And it was passed from one person to another, adults and students included, culminating today in the baptism of these young people, given their lives to Christ and now know the joy. As we think about Passion Week, now this marks the arrival of, of Jesus. And I've often thought about that. I think about it every time I'm personally in Jerusalem. And I, I stand on the Mount of Olives, looking down over the city of David and the city of Jerusalem. And I think of Jesus and the people. They turned out. They turned out. They were there, thousands of them. They waved their palm branches, and there were so many there that were just wonderful, wonderful Christ followers. But there were many there who waved palm branches and got caught up in the occasion. It was many of those same people that, called out, crucify him, that chose Barabbas over Jesus, said, do away with him. It was those same people. Man looks on the outward appearance, and God looks upon the heart. He sees you. He knows what you did yesterday. He knows where your heart is, no matter what palm branch is in your hand. No matter what suit of clothing you're wearing, no matter what part of the world in which you live, no matter your comforts and your appearances, no matter your bank balance, He knows. He knows what's in our hearts. I want to read to you an amazing account. We're going to be in Mark's Gospel, chapter 15. And I want to share with you today as a prelude to participating in communion together. And I, I want to make sure that you're ready, that you have a cup and you have something uh, to eat. Not in terms of a meal. Jesus rejected that. All you need is the tiniest cracker, corner of a piece of bread. But I want to, as we prepare for this, to begin in Mark chapter 15. The Bible says, as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus, and they led him away, and they delivered him over to Pilate, and Pilate asked him, Are you the king of, king of the Jews? And he answered, You have said so. Of course they did. They were waving palm branches just a little few minutes before. Just read that again. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Have you ever noticed Jesus answered? Well, evidently, you the ones who said so. You were all standing there cheering when I arrived. 
verse 3, And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked, Have you no answer to make and see how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder at the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas. Just by the way, everybody, just because someone's dressed in the clothing of the clergy, be very careful that you attest, no matter who it is, by the truth of the Word of God. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, And what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? They shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, Released for them Barabbas, having scourged Jesus. He delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisted together a crown of thorns, and they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail the King of the Jews! And as they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him, and when they had mocked him, they stripped the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And then they led him out to crucify him. I have an unusual title to this Lord's Supper. It just simply is despite unbelievers. You and I are living in an unbelieving world. And there's so much that we could say. Even in our own beloved nation, there are Hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of wonderful, believing Christian men and women and young people. Look at you. Just look at you. But in this country, We are surrounded in our communities by hundreds of thousands of those who stand and cheer but who don't believe. They're in our schools, they're in government. We've got thousands of people who will blaspheme the name of Jesus one minute after they have praised his name. And the picture's here, and Jesus knew that. And on Palm Sunday, perhaps... 
God would really speak to us if we took a look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. What was it about him? He came here into Jerusalem in this euphoric welcome. They waved palm branches. And they gathered. It was a worship service bar none. And the next minute, these same people did four things to him. Number one, they bound him. That's what the Bible says even in verse 1 here. The same one that they had been welcoming, they bound him. They tied him up. When I began to study that, God was showing me something. Mankind tried to restrict Jesus, tie him up, reduce him, hold him back. It's what usually happens if police sadly have to put handcuffs on you. It's designed to stop you being able to get away. Somehow this unbelieving world thought that they could bind the Son of God and stop Him from carrying out whatever it is that He was, because they actually acknowledged Him. Second thing they did was they bullied Him. From verse 2, here in Mark's Gospel, particularly verse 2 and 3, they bullied Jesus. Bullying is one of the most heinous things that bullies do to people they want to bring down and belittle. Then they bartered for him in verse 6. They said, well, let's do a trade. Let's swap Jesus. Let's put him on the auction block. Let's bid and let's go ask the court of public opinion. If ever a church ever has to take a survey about the things of God, everything about Jesus is never up for the auction block. It's never open to debate. The highest bidder is never placed in the hands of public to determine the lordship of Christ. And the fourth thing they did to him was they bruised him. Verse 15 through 20, they beat him relentlessly, mercilessly. The Bible says he was bruised because of our sin bruised for our transgression. And you and I sometimes unintentionally we recoil from the horror of the beating and the bruising that the Son of Man took upon the cross. In all likelihood, the bruising that he received rendered him almost unrecognizable. It was most likely. Considering the nature of a cat and nine tails, which was used, which was designed to inflict unimaginable damage to the body.
rendered the Lord Jesus Christ so beaten to within an inch of his life. And even all our own understandable perception of trying to make certain that the Jesus that we portray is always very neatly on the cross. These people hated him so much, they took out their venomous hate and anger against him. And despite these unbelievers, with all of that, despite this, Jesus saw them. He saw them. There was not a moment from his arrival in Jerusalem as they waved those palm branches that Jesus didn't see them. He sees us in our sinfulness. That's why he did what he did. He sees you. He sees you right now. Regardless of how you're dressed, regardless of where you are, regardless of the impression you give, regardless of what other people are saying about you, regardless of your goodness, your kindness, regardless of everything. He sees you. Jesus went willingly to the cross because he saw us. He not only saw them, these unbelievers, but he, he, he really loved them. Wow. <laughs> I find myself saying in, in a human way, which is so inadequate, you got to seriously love somebody to do what Jesus did after they did what they did to him. I suppose we've spent generations trying to describe the love that Jesus has for us. Despite these unbelievers, Jesus saw them and, and he, he loved them. He just loved them because God so loved the world. God loves you, my friend. He sees you. He saw them, these unbelievers. He loved them. His love was so pure that not all the binding and the bullying and the bartering and the bruising was going to stop him. He saw them, he loved them, which is why he died for them. Despite these unbelievers, he died for them. Jesus died for you. He actually carried it through. He, he, he died for them. And because he died for them, Jesus carried them. When Jesus went to the cross... He carried our sin, our hate, our antagonism, 
our struggles, our hypocrisy, our, the battles, the he carried, he carried us, he carries us. He took all of us, this unbelieving world, and he went to the cross and he died. He gave his life for us. Sometimes we just acknowledge the history of that fact, that Jesus died. But the reality is what we believe to be true. He rose from the dead. He's alive, living in me now, and he can live in you, empowering you to bring dead things back to life. God is ready to resurrect your relationship, your marriage, whatever's going in your life. God is ready to begin fresh with you if you'll say yes. If you've never given your life to Christ, let me lead you in a simple prayer right now. You can repeat the words after me or just say, me too, God. Lord Jesus, I ask you to save me. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you can save me. You died and rose from the grave, so I just turn my back on my sin and ask you to lead me. Be in charge of my life. Give me the strength. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It really does start with just that simple confession of faith. I pray that you would know that you're not alone in this walk. We would love to walk alongside you, pray with you. The angels are rejoicing with your decision to give your life today or perhaps to rededicate your life today to Jesus Christ. We have resources Dr. Don has prepared for you. We'd love to put them in your hands absolutely free if you'll pick up the phone and call that 866-899, word number. It's available 24 hours a day. Take a snapshot of the screen or jot it down, 866-899-9673. We would love to pray with you and connect you with those resources today. Thanks so much for joining us for this time of Bible-based teaching from Dr. Don Wilton. We are here because of the generous support of listeners and viewers like you. 